Yes, you, let's start clapping. <coughs> I'm in a celebratory mood <coughs> for lots of different reasons. Parents, grandparents, guests, colleagues, chair of the board of trustees, Mr. Valley, and members of the class of 2021, on behalf of the faculty and staff, I welcome you to Falmouth Academy's 42nd graduation ceremony, coming to you today live and in person. Uh, Gra <laughs> sure, absolutely. <laughs> and streaming worldwide. Uh, graduates, last night I attended a mask burning party. <clears throat> um, a good, hopefully not premature, a good time to be sure, but disappointingly not the ritualistic affair you might expect. No costumes, incantations, or elaborate dancing, though certainly a witty excuse for getting together for some conventional fun and fellowship. But the party, and indeed the entire year, <clears throat> has me thinking about masks and not the stylish face coverings we've all been wearing. This is one of, this is one of my favorites, sums up my year. It says, it's fine, everything's fine, I'm fine. <clears throat> but the metaphorical masks that we don every day, masks with which we present one face to the world, the one we think they want to see, <clears throat> the person we think they want us to be, <clears throat> but also conceal the face we'd recognize as truly our own, as the person we really are. Alan Moore, the author of my favorite graphic novel, V for Vendetta, and like always, read the book, not the movie, don't see the movie, he said, you wear a mask for so long you forget who you were beneath it. Moore suggests the longer you disguise yourself as, say, the popular kid, the follower, the indifferent slacker, the always cheerful kid, the kid following a traditional path they think is expected of them, the more you risk losing touch with who you really are. And the world may not notice, but you will, and it won't feel right. <clears throat> You'll know something's wrong. I remember when I was interviewing for headships a few years back, and within a few hours, I could usually tell if the school was right for me. I, I could also sense who they were looking for, and that maybe with just a few small changes, I could be that guy, I could be that person. My mother offered me, though, some simple, but given my first three years here at Falmouth Academy, what turned out to be life-changing advice. She said, you better be yourself entirely, because if you're somebody different and they like that guy and they hire that guy, you're kind of stuck being that guy for years and years. At all school meeting this year, I shared excerpts from Junior Henry Kwan's interview with director of the Cape Symphony, Jung Ho Pak. In it, Pak said, as I conduct musicians around the world working with some very high level young people, I see on their face perfection, but I don't see who they are. Have you ever been to see an orchestra, Pac said, and you see one or two people who are just themselves on stage? They're somehow like, like mutants, like they've discovered the core of joy, some kind of life source. But there are others of whom you'll say, I don't see who you are through this instrument. It's like they're wearing a mask, he said. Can you imagine? If you went through it your entire life and had to wear a Halloween mask, or every time you played a saxophone, you had to wear a, a mask so no one, no one could see who was playing the saxophone? Wise words. And so as you can see, yeah, I've been doing a little bit of thinking about masks. And while people will tell you that mask wearing is a phenomenon particular to high school, I guess I would suggest that you not believe that. Life will, on more than one occasion, feel a little bit like high school. Falmouth Academy, though, rightfully prides itself as an accepting place that invites students to be their authentic selves and discover their unique voices. But I suspect even here, we've all had to mask up on one or two mornings, maybe more. It's therefore my ardent hope and my heartfelt advice that when you turn left on Highfield Drive in about an hour and head off into the future, wherever it is and whatever it has in store for you, you can show that feature, that future, who you really are. Now, after lighting and releasing lanterns at last week's senior dinner, I've had quite enough of fire for one year. But part of me does wish I could have arranged a bonfire to be set on the other side of the road there in the boys' field. Because seniors, my parting three words of advice to you, burn your mask. <clears throat> It's now my honor to introduce to you our valedictorian, who I think also happens to play the saxophone and isn't really one prone to wearing masks himself. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming to the podium, Mr. Noah Glasgow.
Mr. Green, Mr. Valley, faculty, families, and friends. We're so happy to see our families and friends gathered in person today. Last year, I spent four months away from Falmouth Academy at a semester program called the Mountain School. The first time I opened the desk assigned to me, I was completely bewildered. The interior was covered with dozens of quotes left in pencil and highlighter and permanent marker. I soon found out that at the end of every semester, students were asked to leave advice or some encouraging sentiment to their room's future occupants. There were bits of poetry and philosophy, such as a striking quote from the poet Wendell Berry, I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. Then there was practical advice, like wear wool socks. And there were even some simple declaratory statements like Jack was here. <laughs> In your dorm room, you begin to imagine who was Jack? Where was here? And did he ever want to milk a cow? <laughs> no, he did not want to milk a cow. That was a joke for those of us who followed Jack Burden through the 600 pages of the novel, All the King's Men. <laughs> Imagination is a powerful tool. It's the starting point for great works of art and literature, but it's also how the most brilliant scientific thinkers have revolutionized our world. Without imagination, we wouldn't have the glamour of Fitzgerald's Gatsby or the greatness of Shakespeare's Hamlet. In the realm of physics, Einstein had to imagine a world where time, just like gravity or motion, was defined in relation to its frame of reference. Einstein once said that imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Imagination is undoubtedly one of the great strengths of the class of 2021. The senior self-portraits in the connector hall, if you've had a chance to see them, stand as a testament to that. From Sama Zaman's Coca-Cola mobile to Eliza Chun's 1,000 hand-folded paper cranes. Year after year, our imaginative talents have led to our dominance in Spirit Week activities. We have yet to see any grade perform an artistic expression that was as daring or creative as our send-off for Mr. Deasy in sophomore year. We assembled a giant jigsaw puzzle form to create a tribute to our remarkable teacher and to reflect on his most meaningful lessons. Over the past six years, our class has continually imagined how we could make Falmouth Academy a stronger and more vibrant community. The class of 21 started the Mandarin Club, helped to start Students for, so for Social Justice, and introduced Falmouth Academy's first student newspaper in two decades, the Chandlery. And yet our class is rich in imagination in a much more compelling sense. Imagination isn't just a synaptic pathway through which we come up with an idea and bring it into being. It does more than allow us to create works of art and preview life's coming attractions. It is an attitude, a skill, a mystifying tool that helps us understand our world. One of the roles of an education is to train us to make the imaginative leap from our own concerns and the things we take for granted to what other times, places, and circumstances might have been like, and to imagine the experiences of other people in our own time. Imagination lies at the heart of tolerance and social justice. It's at the core of empathy. It makes you think of Atticus Finch, doesn't it? You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. So when the class of 21 helps to start something like Students for Social Justice, the role of imagination isn't limited to the act of petitioning for a new club. It's embedded in the very human desire to wonder, what if the world could be a better place? This desire runs deep in the class of 2021. This kind of what if thinking drives the engines of change and empathy, but this what if thinking can lead to anxiety and fear and a heightened imagination has a tendency to foresee and to linger on all the potential for trouble and grief in our lives and in the lives of others. Thinking this way doesn't drive change or empathy. It doesn't allow us to seek new perspectives. Instead, it can freeze us into hopelessness and inaction. I'd like to return to the Wendell Berry poem 
a fragment of which I first saw in that desk at the mountain school. It goes like this. The peace of wild things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Now, this poem was widely shared last year when everyone was caught in cycles of worry and wondered when they would have a moment to go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water. Sometimes we all need a respite from fear for the future. But the poem offers more than a portrait of simple escape. Barry's point is not that we should aim to leave forethought of grief behind forever. In his last lines, he writes, for a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Barry recognizes that we must always return to the responsibilities of the world, even if that includes the potential for despair. The powers of imagination can give us hope. They help us to stand against cynicism and self-centeredness and to recognize the varied perspectives of those around us. The class of 2021 is a deeply empathetic and imaginative group. We are dedicated to each other and to our academic pursuits, but we must also be dedicated to moving forward with an optimistic perspective in whatever paths we choose. The last six years have given us the power to step out of our narrow viewpoints and into the challenge of imagining a world beyond our own assumptions and concerns and making that world a better place. It is time now to imagine what the class of 2021 might write if it had a single desk in which to leave messages to the next generation of Falmouth Academy students. We might copy a fragment of poetry, for a time I rest in the grace of the world. We'll certainly want to leave advice. Take a deep breath. <laughs> now let's consider what statement we could write. This was a year when being present was a challenge, made manageable by our own perseverance and the deep dedication of the entire Falmouth Academy faculty. We've been present more or less for six years and there's no doubt that we've left our mark from clubs to boys lacrosse seasons to spirit week. So instead of Jack was here, we can write, we were here. Imagine that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Academy is a very small school. Having a graduating class where every student knows each other's quirks and passions is a rare privilege we've received through our small numbers. When I first arrived to FA my freshman year, I expected to rely on my best friend who had been there in seventh and eighth grade in order to make friends. I had expected to integrate into a small established friend group, yet to my surprise, that imagined group didn't exist. By my first day, I had met every other student in my grade and had found myself squished in the middle of our pack of freshmen during all school meeting, laughing and joking comfortably with people I hadn't known just an hour ago. Over the years, I've noticed that new students are always welcomed with open arms since they're seen as a possible new friend with a fresh face and new ideas. Yet, no matter how long you had been at the school, FA had always encouraged us to look to each other as opportunities. Every interaction between classmates was an opportunity for growth, inspiration, and support. From climbing a literal mountain together to performing at every spirit week and even struggling through a pandemic, we realized that cooperation was necessary and that we were a team. Through every challenge, we grew closer and even without prompting, we found ourselves participating in grade-wide events such as heated debates over how pizza should be eaten. <laughs> Our small group never caused boredom but rather allowed us to create deeper bonds with each of those around us and the peer reference project was a tangible way to illustrate this. 
The project began by first having students write a small paragraph about each and every one of our peers, demonstrating their character, something that a college couldn't understand about them through a personal essay or transcript. These blurbs were then narrowed down to each of us focusing on one classmate and attempting to encompass who they are in writing. Today, we'd like to share some of these excerpts from these peer references, highlighting the most admirable qualities of the friends surrounding us. We will begin with the foreign exchange students who unfortunately cannot be here in person. And although it will be hard, I ask you please hold your applause until the end. Alice has the knowledge of the world in her head, exuberant, intelligent, and artistic. These adjectives are just preludes to who Alice is. I had the pleasure to watch her paint last year. Alice creates with precision and unwavering focus, channeling a deep passion and knowledge into each and every one of her pieces, from her tiniest doodles of dragons to her most majestic self-portrait. Alice's artwork are just like her, radiant, bold, and brilliant. Alice's talents are not limited to her art, as she is also a great friend to have. Her attentiveness to people closest to her is truly heartwarming, and one of the ways she shows her affection. Alice's dependability amazes me to this day. I truly believe she is going to change the world in some way or another. But in the meantime, I'm glad that she is my friend. Leo Jen is a deeply thoughtful and observant person. In our French class, Leo listens to the ongoing conversations and absorbs information before he pops up and says something so insightful that he causes the class to pause for a few seconds and feel amazed by his responses. I remember during one particular class, the teacher asked simply what we knew about France. The majority of us kept the conversation on a superficial level speaking about who had seen the Eiffel Tower before, or wondering what French escargot tasted like. Then, as always, Leo came into the discussion and talked about the work of his favorite French architect, bringing the whole conversation to another level. Of course, this interest doesn't surprise us because Leo is very artistic. Eliza Chan is a fiery soul, a passionate person. She reflexively brings this passion to conversations, and with passion come opinions. Eliza can spit out facts or thoughts on an issue at a speed that'll make her head spin. That's what makes class with Eliza so entertaining and exciting. As I've gotten to know her more, though, I've discovered that beneath Eliza's analytical side, the side that loves a good debate, is an incredibly sensitive and compassionate human being. Ever ready to think about others, Eliza will be the first to check and make sure that you're doing okay, or ask how your day was. She'll sit and let the conversation fall where it does. Always fluid and easy. So many. Hello? Okay. <laughs> so many of my fondest memories of Luca and McDonald involve music and motion. Whether whimsically playing the violin, cheering on her lacrosse teammates, or simply singing with me at the top of our lungs on a long bus ride back from an away game, regardless of whether we won or lost, Luca radiates positivity and fun. There is also a quiet side of, to Luca, though. Anyone who has heard her play a variety of instruments, sometimes fearlessly in front of the entire school, recognizes that she is an amazing musician. And anyone lucky enough to really know her understands that she is a reliably empathetic friend. I can always rely on Luca to cheer me up after a rough day, or just to listen as we lie together on a boat, the sun beating down on our faces and the salty air mangling our hair. I remember seeing Shirley Long after school, during our junior year, in the workshop by the theater, applying layer after layer of paint, following countless steps to evenly marble our entire set. And good marbling like Shirley's is by no means an easy feat. During class, she watches and observes with a careful depth, taking notes and following along in her book, 
and, unbeknownst to all of us, carefully connecting dot after dot after dot in her mind, weaving a web of observations so unique and so perfect it's clearly indisputable. And when she finally presents it to the class, she blows all of us away with her clear, articulate, and nuanced points. While some see quiet and think of shyness, when I see Shirley, I can only think of her quiet as intelligence. A little while back, Paige and I were lucky enough to be on a school-sponsored trip to Thailand. When we were walking with elephants in Chiang Mai, I was frightened that if I walked in front of the elephant, it would eat my hair, step on my foot. But I looked at Paige, and she was easily walking the elephant like she had done so in her past life. On the other hand, when we went to the markets and learned that insect eating is a delicacy in Thailand, I immediately dove in. Paige hesitated. But when she saw that I was enjoying the insects, she tried one. <laughs> I can't recall if she even chewed. Paige Francis pays particular attention to what's important to others, putting her own matters aside to comfort her friends who need it the most. She faces challenges head on and takes anything that is thrown at her with a confident, decisive attitude and smile. Natalie taught Weinstein acts older than her age. She maneuvers through social interactions with ease while the rest of us fumble through. Afraid of sounding like Goldilocks here, I have to say, in the room, Natalie knows how to be just right. She is exactly the music she likes, a Bach composition, striking the delicate balance between a light wit and measured decorum. She knows when to shush a chaotic conversation with a raised eyebrow, when to give a firm hug to a nervous friend, and when to sit back and listen with attentive ears. Her mere presence slowed down the competitiveness of others, never seeking too much attention, yet somehow exhibiting such natural leadership that the rest of us tend to orient ourselves around her. Justine Clement has always been one of the brightest, most perseverant in our class. Picture sixth grade, when our teacher assigned a project to create a food car, Justine thought of the brilliant idea to power her car with a Coca-Cola and Mentos reaction. Our distracted teacher subconsciously pushed Justine's creativity further by forcing her to present her car without Mentos. Of course, this is impossible, and to this day, none of us knew what our teacher was thinking when she oddly ate part of Justine's project. <laughs> but this moment did give Justine a funny story to tell, one that usually ends with Justine yelling, she ate my Mentos, and bursting into laughter. Although I couldn't see her car in action, the idea of a food car powered by a chemical reaction always amazed me and introduced me to Justine's creativity and intricate planning skills. Almost every morning of high school, Shelby Eldridge has started her day with an energetic lap around the building. Everyone who has ever mentioned this activity says it makes their day to see her smiling face. Shelby has stayed dedicated to this routine for a very long time, but she remains committed to many other larger causes as well, such as volunteering at our local elementary school, a nearby nursing home, or our town service center. Shelby understands that everything should be fair and right in the world and selflessly does whatever she can to promote that belief. When I think of Maisie Saganic, I think of days that can't go wrong. In fact, I think of days that couldn't go more right. Maisie has always found a way to be my light, from playing games with me over the phone to simply sending me a funny text to make me laugh. Sometime over quarantine, I met her at the bike path near her house. We put our masks on and strolled down the path, walking for about an hour to our favorite spot, Black Beach. When we got to the beach, Maisie ran straight into the water, not even hesitating to dive in. It was her courage that inspired me to make my way into the freezing cold ocean only a few seconds later. Maisie's courage has gotten me through the terrors and excitements of high school, and every day she invents new opportunities for happiness and love. <clears throat> I often find myself coming back to my first day at Cape Cod Bagel, where Ruby Gatani had gotten me the job. I was lost in a sea of masked, unfamiliar faces until I saw one friendly pair of eyes and a tight brown ponytail. At that moment, it struck me how very good Ruby is. Her dozens of random acts of kindness flew through my memory. Ruby quietly sending care packages to her friends during quarantine. Ruby sharing goofy, self-deprecating jokes when we were in school together. Ruby remembering every coworker's birthday and baking them a cake. She even found an incredible vegan chocolate raspberry cake recipe for our vegan friend. Did you know you can make a vegan buttercream? 
Ruby had even roller skated four miles on a wet July day years before to hand deliver me ice cream when she knew I was having a rough day. All of these things she does without seeking a reward from the very bottom of her heart. It was 11th grade and the scheduling gods blessed me by putting me in every class Francesca had. That year confirmed something I always suspected, that Francesca is incredibly outgoing. As I spent more time with her, I realized that Francesca is a fantastic friend to have. Cracking jokes in class together and having absurd conversations on a variety of topics, from what flavor jelly bean is the best to the meaning of life, showed me her true colors. Francesca is always around when I'm stressed out, feeling down, or I just need somebody to talk to, and she's never failed to bring a smile to my face. This year I was not so blessed, and I didn't have any classes with her, but seeing her during breaks on Hooker Yard every day is enough to enjoy the friendship we have. Even though our colleges are only one state apart, I'm certainly going to miss Francesca next year. Allow me to set the scene. Mid-October 2017 geometry class. It was the day before we started a new subject. Sensing the anxiety radiating off of his classmates, Drew blurted out a challenge, a circle drawing contest between him and Mr. Jones. After each pulled off nearly perfect sketches, prompting oohs from the class, Drew retaliated. He took a wide stance, breathed deeply, and scribbled out his second attempt. The shape that he made was far from a circle and the entire classroom exploded with laughter. <laughs> Drew walked back to his seat beaming, seeming to feel the amount of stress and worry he had lifted off all our shoulders and the sheer amount of joy he had caused. He sat down, looked at me, and whispered, I think I won. <laughs> Calling Drew just a funny guy, though, would be a huge understatement. Drew is also incredibly passionate and informed about his favorite subjects. I particularly value our conversations about philosophy, often during lunch, but sometimes at 3 a.m. over Snapchat, as they seem to be glimpses into Drew Harmon's wildly impressive mind. John Hughes' 1986 film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, is one of Noah Glasgow's all-time favorites. So naturally, when he heard that I had never watched the movie, he made it his life's mission to get me in front of the classic. At the expense of my sanity, his pursuit lasted four whole years, as I made sure to avoid the movie at all costs, just to annoy my dear friend. But alas, one evening in the beginning of our senior year, he finally won. Though I, though I hate to admit defeat, I must admit that the movie's humor and sentiment thoroughly took me in. It wasn't until I actually completed the film that I realized exactly why this movie is so integral to Noah's identity. As Ferris optimistically exclaims in the beginning of his day off from school, the question isn't what are we going to do, the question is what aren't we going to do. Right there, carpe diem, that's Noah. Last year, I had LMA Cazalt in one of my daily study halls. It quickly became one of my favorite times during the day, and a large reason for that was LMA. LMA's sense of humor is what stuck out to me most. She would always have something funny to add, turning conversations that should have lasted five minutes into a joke filled back and forth so it would take up the whole period. But her humor is far from the only thing I respect about LMA. In math class, she's consistently the person I go to for help when I'm confused or lost on the material. I turn to her not only because of her high proficiency in and understanding of the material, but also because the way that she makes what for me is usually a quite infuriating experience enjoyable. And LMA is someone I've grown to rely on as a classmate and a friend. Maria Medeiros is one of the few people who can make me laugh so hard that I can't stand. We usually find ourselves laughing at something that, from the outside looking in, doesn't make much sense. When we took a trip together to Colorado, it was beyond freezing when we were walking around outside. But we look at each other and, as usual, had the same idea. We ran into the middle of an open field, did some sort of odd-looking ballerina twirl, and then simultaneously broke out into laughter. That's just what life with Maria is like, full of warmth and comfort. She is a true friend, one who believes in those around her. No matter how big or small the accomplishment is, I know that she will always be in my corner, supporting me and cheering me on. During freshman year, when I was a new student, our class went on a grade-wide whale watch. Socially awkward and timid, I walked up to a group of students hanging out on the deck. 
The wind whipped at our hair and our eyes, freezing the tips of our fingers and our toes. And as everyone shivered together, I remarked, God, I'm really cold. Do you want a hug? said a voice from behind me. I turned to see Jordan Watson standing there, arms wide open. I think I had spoken maybe two words to her before that moment, yet here she was, asking me if I wanted to hug her. Shocked and grateful, I accepted. Over the years, I have slowly built a friendship with Jordan and have dis discovered that she is someone to whom I can go to feel comfortable, light, and refreshed. The essence of Jordan shines through in everything she does, painting it with all with an authenticity that makes it wholly her own. One particular night during our ninth grade class trip to farm school, we were asked to put on a talent show and only a few brave souls volunteered to perform. Maddie Valley was one of them. Taping her mouth with duct tape, which was possibly an artistic choice or a way to stop herself from involuntarily singing, she used her hands as puppets to dramatically perform her recording of Bohemian Rhapsody. I don't think any of us had expected Maddie to do this. Um, Maddie is naturally reserved and would be the first to say this. She even recited a speech about the power of being an introvert uh, for Declamation Day in eighth grade. Her puppet performance was unique, hilarious, and entertaining. Maddie is continuously unfolding like a flower, showing more and more of her amazing personality. Optimistic, kind to all those around her, and incredibly intelligent, Maddie is a friend who will never turn you away. Sitting in the hall near the gym became a tradition of ours during our study hall last year. During that hour, we had to do homework or just to relax in one another's presence. Sama was always a smiling face out of the four of us. Every time I looked up for whatever I was doing, she either had a huge grin on her face or was concentrating on whatever complicated work she had. Have you ever tried eating tinfoil? All of us lifted our head and looked at Sama with a questioning look. Then we burst out laughing. It was such a Sama thing to say. She just smiled at us in that enigmatic way that suggested she might have been pulling our leg, and we all started having a conversation about weird things we'd eaten or just our favorite foods. Sama's a mom can make anybody feel comfortable around her. Her personality draws you in, and once you've gotten to know her, you're hooked. Sitting out in the sun after a long day at the beach, we had only been resting for a few minutes at most when the sound of the ice cream truck rang in the distance. Alyssa's face lit up with a sudden joy, and I couldn't help but laugh because her reaction was so unexpected. She told me that at her usual beach that she visited, there was never an ice cream truck, so that explained her burst of kid-like energy when it showed up. Alyssa would ask if I would go to her, go with her to pick out a treat, but by the time I had finished joking about how adorable something so small to me had made her so happy, the ice cream truck had already left, much to her dismay. Even though this story might not necessarily have a happy ending, this day captures her personality perfectly. Alyssa McDonald is the type of friend with whom you could be doing something wild and crazy or absolutely nothing at all and still manage to have the time of your life. Victoria Searle approaches most things in life with confidence, passion, and sincerity. Musical taste can be a very personal thing, what you like or what you don't like but Victoria is able to recommend a perfect song to anyone. Picking up on subtle social cues, she can tell the exact mood you're in at that given moment and recommend a song based on that, from mellow to pop to punk to rap. There are only a few times when I had thought I had found a new artist or song to show her, only to find out that she had already heard it a few months prior. In turn, she would then give me a song to listen to, and, of course, I would love it. Victoria is a careful listener, one who approaches everyone with the same amount of attention and respect. She makes you feel loved and welcomed, even if it's the first time you've talked to her. Lei Hua Zhu is better known to her teachers and classmates as Dimple, a very fitting name given her often smiling expression. Dimple is also a kind, patient, and skilled teacher. In one of the many ways she has demonstrated these qualities was an offering to run a Mandarin club after school teaching kids her age her native language. Dimple's cheerful announcements at all school meeting to her students in the club made me want to join, although I knew I didn't have the time. Dimple further brought a little bit of her culture into her school on Chinese New Year through a delicate and beautiful performance on her guqin. Her willingness and desire to share her culture with all of us was amazing and inspiring. 
Some of my favorite moments with Anna Holine are when we are outside on the FA fields, either in practice or watching games, and I find four-leaf clovers with her. Although she's never found one, every time I do, I'm always with her. I think this shows just how lucky I am to have her as a friend. Anna doesn't complicate things between us and is always there to listen, to help me, or to just give me space if I need it. We can talk about anything and everything and never run out of things to say. Maybe this is because she's very dedicated to and passionate about many things. She shows her dedication to the environment by picking up trash at the beach or in the woods, trying in little ways to make a difference. When she is passionate about something, whether she is trying to better the world around her or make a friend's day better, Anna finds a way to do what she can. Ellie, Thomas, and I were on the beach with our warm drinks in hand as the cold wind whipped our faces. I turned to look at her at this time, determined to keep a straight face, but alas, we burst into fits of giggles. We were 17 years old and chasing seagulls on the beach for a photo assignment. After a few moments, we pulled ourselves together, mostly, and did the shoot, taking turns running down the beach and scaring the birds towards each other. I remember feeling ridiculous, but in the best way. Ellie has this incredible ability to bring a sense of lightness and joy into whatever activity she is doing. I have always admired how Ellie seems to wield her camera as if it's an extension of her arm. From lively street shots to quiet portraits, her brightly colored pictures speak to the humanity of the world around her. Creativity and sincerity are at the core of who Ellie Thomas is. If you asked anyone in our grade to say something about Caitlin Corcoran, they would undoubtedly say that she is a dog person. This is because she loves not only her own dog, Star, so much, but also the dogs that she works with. Caitlin is currently employed at a veterinary hospital, which is one step closer to achieving her dream of being a vet. And I could never complain about all the cute puppy pictures she shows me. But Caitlin's care also extends to people. Before I could drive myself to school, I would get dropped off around 40 minutes early. It quickly became one of my favorite parts of the day. Caitlin asked her parents to bring her to school at the same time so that I wouldn't be alone. It became our tradition to walk around school every morning and talk. And even though we talked throughout most of the day, we always had stuff to talk about the next morning. Henry Thompson has always been someone I could just talk to at any moment. Frequently, we'd get into discussions during lunch in our science classes on various topics, and we'd find ourselves relating to each other in tiny and unexpected ways. I got to know Henry a bit more last year when we were all on a field trip in the mountains. We were just hanging together in our tent, talking about the going-ons of our lives. When Henry had sprained his ankle earlier in that trip, which had stuck him in that room, it was, must have been difficult for him, but he still seemed upbeat the entire time. Henry's the type of person I am happy to just sit back and listen to as they reflect. He's a great and approachable guy, and if there's anyone in the school I can consider a close friend, it's Henry. Ella Haywood is one of my favorite people to be with during the quiet moments. We once did a project for science class that involved exploring B.B. Woods to study nature. On the final day, Ella and I went out to the punch bowl, a kettle pond, for our writing sessions. As we observed our surroundings, we spent time laughing and joking around as she crouched on the boulder like a strange bird. It was my favorite day of the entire project. Ella embraces all parts of herself, especially her passion for dance. Every day after school, she dances for hours, from ballet to hip hop. No matter how exhausted she is, she does the best she can every night. It's all part of what makes Ella her kind, passionate self. Ryan and I met when we were eight years old and spent summers climbing trees and playing make-believe. We've essentially grown up together, and in my friendship with him, Ryan has never hesitated to show compassion. When I fall asleep early at sleepovers, Ryan is the one to cover me with a blanket or toss me a pillow. When I find myself alone and upset, Ryan is the one to say, I'll just sit with you until you're feeling better. Whether through a FaceTime call to discuss physics homework or a study hall in the library where he, once again, explains to me the concept of trigonometric functions, I turn to him for help. Rather than flaunt his own skills, Ryan Waite opts every time to support those around him. I vividly remember the morning after one guy's night at Eric's house. Eric, James, and I were hanging out while I waited for my dad to pick me up. When he arrived, out of the blue, Eric offered to take us all on his boat, dads included. What came of that impromptu gesture was a multi-hour boating trip involving exploring hard-to-reach beaches and swimming at places where we were probably 60 or so feet above the sea floor. On that warm and sunny day, it was obvious that Eric was in his element, 
After all, he had spent the summer working as a lifeguard. But what was especially nice was that he took the time to make sure we were as well. Naturally generous, Eric Palmer always does his best to make sure everyone is all right and having fun. <coughs> Not long ago, James Goldbach and I and two other friends were driving around Plymouth after getting food. And he played us a song in the car that he had created from scratch. He said he had made it all in GarageBand, from the beat to the vocals. It was a unique mashup of a few genres that I hadn't really heard before. I said it sounded like a song I'd hear on the radio, and our two other friends agreed. I was very impressed and also proud. I wasn't very surprised though, and that's because I know James has an incredible ear for music. James is also very active physically too, having played soccer, lacrosse, and basketball. He knows how to conduct himself with maturity in heated situations. Above all, James is always there for his closest friends, practically anyone else who needs his support and friendly guidance. Nowadays, it's rare to find a friend, let alone person, as forgiving and true to himself as James. Something that I've discovered about Beatrice is that she is not a fan of roller coasters or any kind of what she would consider to be high-risk rides. You would never know it though, because in the summer going into freshman year, she and I spent the entire day laughing, eyes wide, screaming our heads off at Six Flags, a tradition we would continue for the next two summers at our town's local fair. On all three of these occasions, I was having the absolute time of my life, and it wasn't until the most recent one that I fully realized that although B was having just as much fun, it wasn't due to a shared love of adrenaline. What B has continued to show me throughout our friendship is her enormously kind heart. Beatrice Madison's ability to recognize and put her close friend's needs and wants before her own and to surely be happy for them is unmatched. As all who have been through high school English classes will know, reading Shakespeare in a way that even moderately resembles a sensical speech is extremely challenging, let alone having the ability to phrase, inflect, pause, and emphasize each sentence in its intended manner. Yet, hearing Trevin read the verses of Hamlet in English class this year, nobody would know that he wasn't a wandering thespian who just walked out of the 17th century on his lunch break from the Globe Theater. His speech is fluid, his accents are flawless, and his ability to recognize puns and jokes in Old English truly baffles me. This combined with his clear, raw talent for math, his expansive knowledge of the history of American politics, his talent for music production and graphic design and many other skills make Trevin McKeon an all-around stellar intellectual and a genuinely interesting and awesome person to call my friend. During our class trip junior year to the mountains of New Hampshire, the grade did a team building exercise in which we walked along a wooded path in complete darkness. To my great dismay, I was chosen to be one of the two leaders. The solution to my worries? Ask Sonia to walk right behind me. <laughs> she filled the journey with words of caution, encouragement, and motivation, like, you're doing great, and watch out, I think there's a tree up ahead. <laughs> the thought that more than 30 others followed us completely vanished from my mind. Sonia is the one I and many others look to in times of need. Her help and advice come without a hint of judgment. Sonia may have the official title of school president, but regardless of her role in student government, Sonia Roger Gopal is a figurehead of both the grade and the school, helping us move forward no matter what the future might hold. There is almost always a smile on Silas Clark's face. I think he gets it from some adventurous, mischievous spark he's hiding. Sometimes Silas will just look at me with a glint in his eye <laughs> and I'll double over with laughter. A friend once told me that Silas takes life as it comes, that nothing really phases him. But he isn't one to let life wash past. In school, you could give Silas any random topic and he would find the beauty in it. Introduce him to a friend and he'll find the beauty in them too.
Thank you, thank, thank you, graduates. And, and you know, I've been to so many graduations where the students are sort of props for, for us to just look at. And here, I think we leave this afternoon knowing a little bit of something about each of them. And so, terrific job, all. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jones. Might you have some business to conduct with the head of school? <clears throat> Indeed, I do, Mr. Green. It is my pleasure to present the students of the class of 2001 who have completed all the requirement. 2000, <laughs> who have completed all the requirements of graduation and have been recommended by the faculty of Falmouth Academy. Well, by all means then, Mr. Jones, shall we proceed? <laughs> Chairman Valley, would you please stand and join me in presiding over the presentation of diplomas? <clears throat> Our first three are in absentia, and if I'm on TV here right now, I just want to say, Leo, Shirley, Dimple, we love you. <clears throat> These students were, were going to school through computers sometimes from 8.15 at night till 2.45 in the morning. <clears throat> so let's begin. <clears throat> Ju Xuan, Shirley, Long, in absentia. <clears throat> Chung Xiao Leo Jiang, in absentia. <laughs> Lei Hua Dimple Xu, in absentia. <laughs> and let's get rolling. <clears throat> Victoria Lee Searle. <laughs> Drew Maxwell Harmon. <laughs> Mary Elizabeth Saganic. <laughs> Jordan Rose Watson. <laughs> Alyssa Lauren McDonald. <laughs> Sama Zaman. Alice Bowen Tan. <laughs> Ellie Cesaria Thomas. <laughs> Eliza Elizabeth Davis Chun. Maria Natalia Medeiros. <laughs> Moment of awkward silence, followed by a nifty maneuver. <clears throat> Sonia J. Raja Gopal. <laughs> Henry H. Thompson. <laughs> Paige Olivia Francis. Luca Alessandra McDonald. <laughs> Beatrice Was Madison. <laughs> K. 
Caitlin Marie Corcoran. Justine Renee Clement. Ella Mae Margaret Cazalt. <laughs> Ella Hathaway Haywood. Yes. Francesca Rose Farina. <laughs> Noah Elliot Glasgow. William Ryan Waite. <laughs> James H. Goldbach. Anna Gail Alexander Holine. Eric Ryan Palmer. <laughs> Silas William Clark. <laughs> Ruby Louise Gatani. <laughs> Madison Grace Valley. Trevin Michael McKeon. <laughs> Shelby Larissa Eldridge. <laughs> and Natalie H. Todd Weinstein. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the latest, one of the greatest, and certainly one of the most memorable graduating classes in this school's history, the class of 2021. When we rehearsed on Thursday, I said I would deliver that line with as much passion as I could, but I can't guarantee they'll stand for you. But you did, thank you so much. Congratulations, graduates. Um, I'll close with a few thank yous and a final thought. First, thank you to our Buildings and Grounds team, Josh Levesque, Richard Sperduto, John Dooley, and Mike Sheridan for all of your hard work. And to George Shar, Charlie jo Jodwin, and our friends from FCTV, thank you for managing the technical components of our ceremony. To Matthew Coggins, Matteo, Derek, Emily Lazarus, and G George Shar for giving us the gift of your music. To Lalise Malillo, Susan Moffitt, and Doug Jones for the roles that you have played, and especially to Carmen DeSanto, Amy Cummings, Leslie Walters, and Liz Ledwell for planning and staging this afternoon's event. Please join me in a round of applause. And graduates, please join me in thanking the teachers who circle the perimeter. What a fitting visual metaphor for the care and concern for which they have surrounded you.
Now let's acknowledge, next to the young people seated at my left, the most important people at this event, without whom you would not be here. Would the parents of Falmouth Academy's class of 2021 please stand and receive our deserved praise for your perseverance, your partnership, and most importantly, your patience as we waited for an event that sometimes seemed more like a Midsummer Night's Dream than reality. Thank you to the parents of the class of 2021. Everybody up. <laughs> Okay, you can sit down. <laughs> and would the grand, I'm not gonna make you stand, and would the grandparents of the class of 2021 please just raise your hands, okay? <laughs> thank you for having raised, thank you for having raised such smart and generous sons and daughters who have had the wisdom and foresight to send your grandchildren to Falmouth Academy and for all that you've done to make this day possible. All right, so for the past 20 or so years, it's been my custom to close with an excerpt from my favorite novel, The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, a book which I still keep on my bedside table and which I'm basically always reading. This passage, a framed copy of which actually hangs on the wall in my office, is spoken by the protagonist, Alyosha, who is addressing a group of boys he has been mentoring through the death of one of their friends. And he says to them this, children, even if we are occupied with most important things, if we attain to honor or fall into great misfortune, still let us remember how good it was once here. When we were all together, united by a good and kind feeling which made us <clears throat> better, perhaps, than we really are. You must know that there's nothing higher <clears throat> and stronger and more wholesome and good in life for life in the future than some good memory, especially a memory of childhood, of home. If a man carries many such memories with him into life, he is safe to the end of his days. Let us then be first and above all kind, then honest, then let us never forget each other. <clears throat> I give you my word for my part that I'll never forget one of you. Every face looking at me now I shall remember even for 30 years. You are all dear to us. From this day forth we have a place in our hearts for you all. I beg you to keep a place in your hearts for us. Friends at Falmouth Academy, how lucky we are to have more than one good memory. May they sustain us for the rest of our days. Class of 2021, thank you for what you've done here as a class at Falmouth Academy. You've been great leaders, you've taken care of each other, and we're going to miss you. We will miss all your indiv individual idiosyncrasies, your positive spirit, and the whimsical and joyful approach you brought to all that you did. You have been a great class. And now you move on to once again quote our friend Alyosha Karmatsov, we will never forget you. Now we have one last item of business. Student body president Raja Gopal, Vice President Goldbach, are you prepared to ring the gong of power? Yes! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> the ceremonial resp response should have been, we are. But we'll take yes. It is with great joy and satisfaction that I hereby declare the 42nd session at Falmouth Academy. No, give it a give it a whack. Closed. Congratulations, seniors.